And so we've got a great deal to look forward to tonight. If you haven't heard Paul speak in the past, you need to know this, and you would tell this at the end of one of his seminars. Paul works it. He studies intensely, very deeply on everything he shares. What I like about Paul is he doesn't speak to speak. He studies it to understand it. There are a lot of people that speak, and they get the gist of it or the idea. But Paul Kramer has to understand it before he teaches it or speaks it. We are the beneficiaries of that. So we're in for a precious night, very important night, because this is what's going to talk about our roots and where we come from. Remember, think about America. America has denied its roots. In 2016, America has denied the fact that we've had a Judeo-Christian root system. In fact, you can say some other religions more freely than you can Christianity in this country right now. And so here's our encouragement. Let's expect God to walk with us as Paul shares, okay? Let's pray. Father, it's truly a joy we know how much you love your people, and we want to thank you that we were all birthed by the word of truth. So thank you tonight, Father, for the freedom we have in the here and now to hear about you, your heart, your written word, and thank you for Paul Kramer. Father, we thank you that his words will be filled with spirit and life, and that they're going to penetrate us, Father, and let them stay within us until they accomplish your will. Be glorified in this process. Amen. Paul Kramer, let's welcome him. Well, thank you for that warm welcome. Thank you for the kind word to you. Thank you all for coming out. It's kind of a little bit of a drizzly night. It's like every time I do a talk, it rains. I don't know the moral. I guess the moral is if you want rain, I'll come do a talk. <laughs> We need the rain, though. Anyway, well, uh, I want to welcome you to the fourth in a series of Christianity Under Fire, Advancing Your Faith in a Hostile Culture. And tonight we're going to be talking about the providential history of the Bible. And before we launch into that, I wanted to share a little story. I don't know if you caught this in the news. I know the Super Bowl's over, but this is a, a Super Bowl story. Uh, Bob had bought tickets on the 50-yard line for the Super Bowl. Great seats. And uh, he was sitting there in his seat, it's on the aisle, and a guy came down the aisle and said, uh, excuse me, sir, is that seat next to you taken? And Bob said, no, it's, it's empty. And the guy said, wow, why would anybody want to miss the premier sports event you know, of the year? And Bob said, well, um, I've been coming to the Super Bowl since 1967, and I um, uh, usually brought my wife, and, uh, but she passed away recently. So the guy said, uh, wow, that, I'm sorry to hear that, uh, but, you know, couldn't you have asked a, a family member or a friend or a neighbor or someone like that to, to come? And he said, Bob said, no, I, I couldn't do that. And the guy said, well, why not? And Bob said, well, that's because they're all at the funeral. <laughs> okay. Little humor, very little. Uh, okay, a little housekeeping before we get started. Um, again, want to welcome you all to this uh, series. The purpose is twofold. Uh, firstly, uh, I hope that this information will be encouraging to you as believers in, uh, and give you a deeper appreciation for the Word. And for those that are not believers that may be watching YouTube or whatever, I hope that uh, this information will make you kind of rethink maybe your skepticism of the Bible. Uh, and so those are kind of the purposes for this. My qualifications, um, I have not been to seminary, I have not had formal training in this. I have spent a, a number of years in research, and so I'm just going to give you the, the uh, benefit of the research, but I don't have a diploma in this. So I thought I'd just, uh, many times YouTube, they'll, they'll point out that you're a fraud, and I'll just get that out of the way. I'm not trying to fool anybody. Um, <clears throat> Let me say that some of the information I'm going to be giving you, there are uh, still disputes about. Scholars uh, still have uh, are wrestling with some of these issues. I'm going to give you kind of the consensus opinion as, as, I've, as I've seen it. 
And so we're going to hit this at about a 10,000 foot level. This is a subject that takes up semester after semester in college for seminarians. And we could spend months delving, delving into all these issues. So we don't have time. We're just going to hit this at, at a very high level. At the end, if you stay to the bitter end, we have free books down here. Uh, you're welcome to take notes as we go, but in the book will be all the notes I'm, uh, on this talk. So um, those are available, and there's a lot of uh, show-and-tell items up here. So uh, I would like to take time to thank my wife, Debbie. Uh, she has diligently typed these manuscripts and helped me get these uh, self-published, and she's uh, been a proofreader. And my son, Matt, who designed the covers, uh, I have no creativity, and he is on the other end of the spectrum there, so I let him take care of the, the jacket covers for me. So uh, I want to appreciate their efforts. Okay, providential history of the Bible may seem kind of redundant, but I thought that's sort of a, a, a running theme in these, in these talks. Uh, I think this is one of the most fascinating stories in history. Uh, it was a, uh, a thing that brought me back to Christianity after a long sabbatical. Uh, the, uh, the the research I did in this, and uh, to me, it's it's unparalleled in history, the, uh, the history of the Bible. Um, so it's it's a personal thing for me because um, of how God has preserved His Word for such a long time. It's unparalleled in my estimation. The uh, Bible represents God's special revelation to mankind. We've talked um, earlier. We had a Christianity and science talk, and that was about uh, general. Revelation, that is, uh, looking at the, at the creation. Here, God is actually revealing himself uh, in, in the Bible, in the words of the Bible. Um, let me, before we launch into this, let me give you some little factoids. You can use these at parties and impress your friends. Um, the Old Testament contains 39 books, as we know, 929 chapters. Middle book is Proverbs. 30 extra biblical books are mentioned in the Old Testament that we do or don't have copies of. Now, for some reason, in the minds of some, that is a disqualifier for the Bible, and I do not get that. Uh, I have a number of books at home, some are here, that reference other books that I can't find. So do I throw the book out that I'm reading because it refers to another book that I don't have? But when we, we, we wouldn't do that, but we apply that logic to the Bible. So some of the books that are uh, mentioned in the Bible are, are known, some are not. That's not a disqualifier. New Testament contains uh, 27 books, 260 chapters. The middle book is 2 Thessalonians. The word Jesus occurs 700 times in the Gospels and Acts. The word Christ occurs 240 times in the Epistles and Revelation. The Bible has around 40 authors spread out over a 1,600-year period, and they're all consistent. That, that's an amazing fact. Um, <clears throat> earliest writings, 3,500 years ago with Moses. 3,500 years ago, Moses penned what's in your Bible. Amazing. Uh, everything was handwritten. That, that is in manuscript form. Anything that was handwritten is called a manuscript. First uh, Bible printed with the press, 1456 AD. First American edition of the Bible uh, printed was in uh, 1752. The Bible is a perennial bestseller of any book in the world, has been for centuries. We're going to talk about, since that draws money, uh, what, what that may have done in some cases to the... Um, to the Bible industry, if you want to call it that. It's believed that there are no known autographs. An autograph is an original. That would be the, the first lambskin that Paul wrote on. It's believed that those don't exist. Probably that's true in the Old Testament because that's 1,600, well, now it's 3,500 years old, but at the time of Christ, those texts would have been 1,600 years old. Probably those are gone. I'm not so sure about the New Testament. If believe that we don't have them, I'm going to get into this in a little bit. Uh, some of the early texts uh, from the New Testament go back almost to the apostolic time. So not sure about that. Um, Protestant Bible contains 66 books, while the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible contains 81 books. We're going to talk about why that is in a little bit. Uh, the word Bible itself comes from Koine Greek. Koine Greek was the sort of common Greek of the, of the, of the time, and we'll talk about how that came to be in just a minute. 
Uh, it's a um, Greek word uh, in the plural biblia and in the singular biblos, um, which in our, has come down to us as Bible. Uh, Jerome in 400 AD called the Bible the divine library, and the first time that term was actually used for the collection of writings we have today was by Chrysostom in 3, 387 AD. <clears throat> Now here's something that's interesting. The New Testament has an amazing amount of attestation or proof. 300 unsealed manuscripts, these are uh, large printed Greek letters, manuscripts we have that go back, and I'll give you the timelines on that in a little while. Uh, 2,600 minuscules, these are smaller cursive Greek letter manuscripts. 2,000 lectionaries, 75 papyri, 25 ostraca. Ostraca are potsherds, they're uh, pieces of pot, that are broken, that have writing on them. They have verses on them. Um, 86,000 quotes from early church fathers. I have a volume down here, one of 25 that I have of home, at home of early church fathers from 100 AD to 400 AD. 86,000 quotes in those books refer to your New Testament. 5,000 Greek manuscripts, 10,000 other manuscripts. There's more proof in the New Testament than any other book in ancient history that I can find. And I've studied ancient history amateurly for a long time. Um, there's more proof for Jesus than there is Augustus Caesar, Plato, or Socrates, or Aristotle. No one would doubt that those people lived. And yet the proof of Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle is very scant. Nothing like the New Testament or the proof of Jesus. We're going to get into more of that later on. Uh, the formal division of Old and New Testament was first proposed by a guy named early church father Tertullian, 200 AD. He first used the word novum testamentum, New Testament. Of course, testament means covenant, so there was an Old and a New Covenant. Now, when you look at your Bible, you go, it's div conveniently divided into chapters and verses. But for 1,200 years, that was not the case. The Bible was one continuous run-on sentence with no break in the letters. Try to translate that. You have to know where the sentence starts and stops and what the punctuation should be. So first time that we had chapters uh, uh, was in 1227. That was done by Stephen Langton. Robert Stephanus further divided New Testament into verses in 1551 AD. Uh, so it wasn't until the Middle Ages that the Bible began to look like what you now have. Uh, the Geneva Bible, which I have a copy of down here, a New English uh, version of it, and I'll say I have a leaf from an original, original Geneva Bible here, it was the first Bible to actually use the chapter and verse uh, method, first complete Bible. Shakespeare quoted from the Geneva Bible 5,000 times in his plays. Languages uh, used in the Bible, we're going to talk more about this next, primarily Hebrew, some Aramaic, and Koine Greek that I mentioned earlier. The red letter edition was produced by an American, Louis Klopsch, in 1899. He was the uh, editor of the Christian Herald magazine. So again, um, a lot of the conveniences we have in our Bible today are recent, uh, recent in history as regards the Christian timeline. Um, there are an estimated 300 prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. The probability of getting 48 of those right, not 300, 48. One times 10 to the 157th power. Uh, in, in science, that's roughly double the limit of impossibility, which is one times 10 to the 80th. Now, what is that number? It is a one followed by 157 zeros. Now, that's not 300, it's 48. Um, here's a pamphlet you can get at Mardell's. This is 100 of them, 100 of the 300. I've looked at these. It's amazing. It is incredible. It is astounding, and it's unparalleled in history. No one has ever done that that I've been, I've been able to find. <clears throat> um, languages of the Bible. Let's get into that. Um, again, we don't, we don't know that we have an original autograph of either Old or New Testaments. We have copies. Uh, the original Old Testament was written in ancient Hebrew. Now, languages change over time. There are languages that exist today that are very ancient. They go way back into BC times. 
and words can change. And so lectionaries and dictionaries are used to define words and their meanings in the context of the particular time frame you're looking at. This is kind of complicated, but uh, words can change over time. And so you have to know what a word meant in the, certain, in the particular time frame it, it was used. Uh, Hebrew and Aramaic are actually sister languages. And they're from the Semitic language. This, this was a term uh, that was uh, used by some Germans in the 1780s, uh, applied to uh, languages that, you, that included Ugaritic, Phoenician, Ethiopian, and Eritrean. And the term Semitic comes from the name Shem. Y'all remember Shem as a, one of the sons of Noah, so it's very ancient. Um, <clears throat> Semitic languages are very ancient, go back to the fourth millennium BC, 4000 BC, with the Akkadians and later the Assyrians and Babylonians. Uh, the term Aramaic comes from Aram, or the land of the Aramians. You'll probably remember that term from the Old Testament, uh, from about 3500 BC. Um, Hebrew and Aramaic are also considered parts of the Canaanite language family from the Middle East. Uh, Aramaic had a thousand year history in BC times, but uh, came to be dominant in the Middle East around 5600 BC after the Babylonian captivity. The, the Jews learned Aramaic under the Babylonians and when they came back out of captivity they brought that language with them and so it was a very much used uh, language at the time of Jesus. Um, Aramaic became the common language in Galilee around 200, uh, 500 to 100 BC and it's believed that that's the language Jesus spoke in. So uh, I don't know if y'all remember uh, 2004, Mel Gibson um, did a movie called The Passion. Did y'all see that? Okay. And if you remember, that was all in Aramaic. A guy named uh, William Fulco, who was a, <clears throat> an expert in Aramaic, helped develop that language, had to supplement with some Syriac, current Syriac Aramaic uh, as needed. Uh, it's funny, when I first heard that, I thought, that, <laughs> that's going to be a huge flop. I appreciate the intent. And I appreciate what Mel Gibson's trying to do, but there's, no one's going to go see some movie in Aramaic with English subtitles. That's just, that's a huge flop. So I, I have kind of given up predicting movies. <laughs> um, Aramaic is still spoken in parts of, uh, in parts of the Middle East. Um, <clears throat> there are parts of the New Testament that are still in Aramaic that were not translated. Words like talithakumi, in Mark, that's an Aramaic term. Rekha in Matthew 5, Maranatha, 1 Corinthians, and Rabboni in John. That's just a few. I've got, there are four or five pages of these and we don't have time to go into all of them, but these were not translated into Greek, into the Greek New Testament that we have. They were left as Aramaic names. Uh, there are a number of names, uh, even of the disciples, that are Aramaic in nature. So um, Aramaic was, was obviously a, a big player language-wise. Hebrew had sort of been relegated to the scribes um, and the intelligentsia and in, trans, in translating and transmitting the Old Testament writings. But Aramaic and, and the Greek became more, more dominant uh, at, at the, near the time of Christ. Um, here's an interesting thing. Uh, the, the, the original Hebrew language had no vowels. Uh, use all consonants. For instance, uh, Yahweh was Y H W H in the original Hebrew. And around between five and eight hundred A.D., a group called the Masoretes. This was a, a group of scribes that took on the responsibility of transmitting and copying the Old Testament. They decided to make the text more readable. They would insert vowels. And so Yahweh became Y A H W E H. Now you don't know that today because Hebrew words have those vowels already inserted in your Bible. But that was not the way that was up until uh, about 800, 800 AD. Okay, flip back, fourth century BC. Y'all know about Alexander the Great. Um, the Greeks conquered a huge area, had a huge empire uh, that went, extended all the way to India. And of course included all the Middle East and, and a lot of ha inhabited uh, Egypt. Um, and so Greek became, the Hellenization of the Middle East took place. And what that means is Greek culture 
and language began to take over. And so Greek became a major player in languages in the Middle East at, at the time of Christ. So you had sort of a multilingual lingual culture. It's kind of like uh, uh, Spanish and English today in our area. Uh, you had um, uh, Greek and Aramaic and Old Hebrew. Uh, proof of that is, if you remember the inscription on the, the pilot foot on, over the, on the cross of Jesus is written in what? Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. So it doesn't mention Aramaic, but it was known that that was, uh, that was a language used in. Let's talk about technicalities, materials, and processes. Um, evidence of writing goes back to 3000 BC, some, some say even earlier than that. Earliest writing came from Egypt and Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia is sort of an area like uh, northern Syria, Iraq, a uh, little bit of eastern Iran, that kind of belt right up in there. That was a very heavily populated time in early BC history. Hieroglyphics and cuneiform, y'all probably know those names, uh, were put on stones or clay tablets, uh, stone walls, uh, columns, where they would be permanent. And uh, <clears throat> a clay cylinder mes method was used in, in Mesopotamia. They'd take a, a, a block of clay and turn it into a roller and put the um, cuneiform um, uh, inscriptions on the clay cylinder. Then you take a, a, a clay tablet and roll that out, and you could do a letter every time you roll that. So you could mass produce letters that, with that process. Uh, we saw the uh, Rosetta Stone in the British Museum, I'm sure that... Uh, the Whartons have seen that, uh, had uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics and Greek, and that's how they were able to decipher hieroglyphics. Um, interesting, interesting story. Um, so what were the materials that, that were written on? Papyrus was a reed that grew in the marshes in Egypt. These were, uh, had long stalks, and the uh, Egyptians learned to cut the stalks and slit them and glue them crosswise and create a, a sort of paper which they could be rolled into scrolls or put into books or, or whatever, sort of glue itself together it would be a smooth surface you could write on. Uh, another writing material was uh, uh, hides. These were animal skins, uh, sheep, goat, cattle. Uh, calf skins are called vellum. And these, uh, these other animal skins are called parchment. And so a lot of the writings come, that come to us are written on that material. Uh, a complete Bible could take a flock of sheep, could take up to a year's salary in lost animals to produce the hides, to produce a whole Bible. Uh, and it would take anywhere from 8 to 12 months for a scribe to sit down and write on all those skins in the entire Bible. So that's why there weren't a whole lot uh, to go around, and they were very expensive, very time-consuming to make. And so what the Jews would do, and other people, would sew these hides together end to end and roll them into scrolls. So the Jews today, you see these uh, Jews at the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall, and they'll have these scrolls. And <laughs> if you want to go with a book, you've got to roll that out to wherever that book is. Uh, not convenient, but uh, that, that's, what they, that's what they use. And so we have a lot of uh, scroll patterns that come from antiquity, the Dead Sea Scrolls for one. Um, in the first century AD, we see codices, is, codex is a book, fancy name for a book. We see books beginning to be produced. They finally discovered, hey, wait a minute, if we have a papyrus page, instead of sewing it together, we'll just sew, sew it on the ends, and we can make a flip-over book. I don't know why it took so long to invent, but anyway, it was a, it was a long process getting to it, just having a book. Now, here's an interesting thing that atheists like to focus on. Well, scribes were careless usually drunk when they transcribed Bibles, I made huge mistakes, lots of typos, wrote stuff in that they wanted to change, and produced Bibles from whatever theology they thought might be appropriate. Well, that's totally false. And how do you know that? Because we have papyrus fragments that go back almost to the time of Jesus' death and resurrection that read like your Bible. Now, if the scribes were careless, and they changed everything, then these 10,000 manuscripts that we have would all be different, and they'd all read different than your Bible. Dead sea, I'm going to get into Dead Sea Scrolls in a minute. Amazing discovery, probably one of the greatest of all times, uh, validated the Bible because it reads like your Bible. Anyway, talk about that in a minute. Ink made from carbon. Um, it was made into a paste, 
And then when the uh, writer was ready to use a quill pen or a, 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 a stylus, he would put water in that, kind of like watercolors, and then write on a skin. Sometimes after skin had been um, used for a long time, the ink began to sort of crinkle off and fade. They would scratch all that off and start a whole new book on top of that skin. And there are some examples of written over skin in some of the um, um, early finds that we have. It's there in some museums. Interesting deal. Um, now, all this would radically change in the 1450s when uh, Gutenberg invented the movable type printing press. Very simple a machine. You wonder why in the world it took so long to invent that thing. But uh, in any event, first time, you didn't have to hand write something. You could, you could put a movable type on a set and just crank out page after page after page. And so Bibles could be mass produced for the first time. They didn't have to be manuscripts, handwritten. Uh, okay, so that's kind of the, an overview of, of uh, processes as we know them and as they've come down to us archaeologically. Okay, let's talk about the canonization of the Old Testament. How did we get the Old Testament? The word canon, not a military word, not something that shoots something. C-A-N-O-N, it's a Greek word. It means uh, a rule of measure, something to measure by, a rod of measure, or whatever, a measuring instrument. And uh, we believe that uh, Moses, of course, wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the Pentateuch. He was believed to have lived around 1500 B.C., so again, that makes the Old Testament in your Bible over 3,000 years old. And it reads like the oldest manuscripts we can find. Amazing deal. If the scribes, let me, let me tell you about, here, here's what the Jewish scribe, here, here, here was his discipline. He either sat at a desk and copied from a copy, or to speed things up, they might have four or five scribes, and one guy would stand in the center and he would read a text, and then they would write it down. Then he'd read the next text, and they'd write that down. That kind of sped things up, because now you got four guys writing instead of, instead of one. Well, they had a very intricate system of ways of checking to see if they had typos and mistakes. They counted letters on a page, counted every letter. They knew how many letters should be on this, that are on this page. Therefore, when I copy, it better be the same number of letters. If it was not, you take this page, wide it up, throw it away, and you start over. And you keep doing that until you have a page that has the exact same number of letters in sequence as this, as this original. They were meticulous because they were transmitting God's Word. They were not careless and stupid and ignorant. These were intelligent people. They were trained, highly trained. They could read and write, which is a step above most of the people at that time. So the, the caricature that scribes were drunken fools that willingly and intentionally changed the Bible and we have a screwed up mess today, it's absolutely false. It's not proven by any historical record. Atheists just make that up. It's, it's not, it cannot be proven. I, I've talked with them on the internet, and I say, prove. Bible's all screwed up, it's all made up, and, and it's been changed. I said, prove it, show, show me, give, give me examples. You know, then you become a bigot. So, um, it's just the evidence of Bibles, Bibles uh, being mistranslated and mishandled are just not there that I've been ever, ever been able to find. In fact, the scribes many times could be severely disciplined if they made a mistake. It was critical. Their work they knew was critical, and they could lose their position. They could lose their they could lose their entire livelihood by making mistakes. Now, if a scribe wanted to make a comment, they would write a note in the side. Have examples of Bibles down here from the medieval times, and you can see the notes are on the side. Today we put the footnotes at the bottom. Back then they put them on the side. That's how they made a comment. They did not change the text of the Bible. This is crazy. These people knew what they were doing. They knew they were handling God's Word. It was a serious deal. So if they wanted comments, they could comment, but it would be over on the side where you could see the comment, not in a change in the text. Okay, sorry, I get a little passionate about that because it really irritates me. Okay. Um, okay, so for 1,500 years, we have the Old Testament being formed. Um, <clears throat> you have to have that time frame to have all the writings because you had to have the exiles and you had to have the prophets be born and live and tell their story. And so all of that took 1,500 years to compile all of the books in the Old Testament. They, they, they didn't all happen in, in one little time frame. It took place over a 1,500-year period, roughly. 
uh, to get all of the writings that would later become the Old Testament. Stark contrast in the New Testament. But anyway, so you have uh, from the time of Moses on up to about uh, 200 B.C., you have all of the writings that would form the Old Testament being written along, along, that, along that path with 40 different authors. Well, uh, fewer than that because there were fewer authors in the Old Testament. But anyway, um, the, the, the Hebrews broke their writings down into the law, which was the, uh, the, the, uh, the Torah, first five books of the, of the Bible, the, of the Old Testament, they had the prophets, and the, and the writings was everything other than those two. Um, the idea of the Old Testament as a book, uh, of, <laughs> or as a Bible even, did not exist until the first century A.D. For a Jew, there's not an Old Testament. That's only appropriate for Christians. For a Jew, there's only a Bible. We call it the Old Testament. They don't call. They call it not the Tanakh. That's the Bible. So we take it for granted today. But back in the first century, it was not not the. There was not a common term. Um, again, they they called their uh, their writings the Tanakh, and they were loosely held. Uh, the uh, the writings of the Jews were sort of loosely held scriptures um, un until the first century. Um, around 200 B.C., the Hebrew, uh, I mentioned this earlier about, about the Greek language, began to be replaced, and a Greek version of the collected scriptures uh, was created in Alexandria, Egypt, and it was called the Septuagint, so-called because there were 70 guys that worked on this translation. They have a copy down here of the Greek and the English uh, it, uh, translated in this in this Septuagint. So it is believed that this was the Bible that Jesus and the apostles referred to, the Greek version of the Old Testament, because it was very common, uh, uh, commonly read. Um, the Septuagint contained in the Old Testament, of course, uh, 15 additional books which came to be known as the Apocrypha. Now, what is that all about? <clears throat> um, Alexandria was a cultural center in Egypt. You have to go, we don't have time to get into the history of it. Had the biggest library in the known world at the time. Intellectuals centered in Alexandria, Egypt. And um, uh, they, uh, uh, they included these apocryphal books, so-called, and I have a copy of those down here, in the Septuagint, but they were not in the original original Hebrew Bible that they were translating from. They added those. There's a lot of speculation about that. I've heard a lot of discussion about why those were in there. Alexandrians were wrong, yada, yada, yada. Um, uh, but in any event, the Apocrypha that Catholics have today in their Old Testament um, was not in the original Hebrew. And this is why Martin Luther and others later on decided to move them out. I get into, I get into details on how that happened. Uh, the Protestant Bible today, you pick up, it's not going to have those. And I'll, I'll talk about why that is. Okay. Um, so the original Hebrew Bible then was pretty well consolidated as, as writings by about 200 B.C. It contained 24 books. Now that's different than our count because the Jews, the Hebrews, would consolidate the prophets, uh, a number of prophets into one book. And so that's why the number, it's, it's the same prophets that you have in your Bible, but they counted them together many times. And so the number of books changes even though it's the same books that you have in your Bible. That's the only difference. Um, <clears throat> Josephus, a first century A.D. Jewish historian, recognized 22 books, but then he combined, he combined four books and two, and so it was the same number, but um, he just he made a combination there. Um, Protestant Old Testament today, of course, contains 39 books because we separate the prophets out as separate books. That's the only difference. Same, same prophets, just a different numbering system. Uh, again, the, uh, the Old Testament for the Jews divided into the Torah, the Pentateuch, first five books, prophets, and the writings. Millennia of Sardis and Origen and Jerome, all uh, weighing in about 170 to 400 AD, all recognized the Hebrew Tanakh 
with the books that you have in your Bible today. So that was settled early on in A.D. times, about the time of Christ. They were coming together on that. Um, now, along with the Apocrypha, many pseudepigraphal, I know these kind of big words, pseudepigraphal writings were produced. I have those in two books down here. Um, these are books that are ascribed to famous people that are total forgeries and fakes. Um, uh, <clears throat> they were known by the Hebrews and they were known by the Christians. They were not lost in some misty past. They were known, recognized, rejected. I've got them. I've read them. The book of Moses. Well, it's not the book of Moses. It doesn't even read like anything you read in the Old Testament. So these were people who wanted to put out something, and they figured if they could stick somebody's famous name on there that people might read it. Uh, I, ring, I used to wring my hands about this, and I, I was worried. I'm like, oh, God, what, how could this happen? And I don't know going on, and the Holy Spirit said, wait a minute. One day, I'm going to work, got a little tap on the shoulder, wait a minute. This is not new. This started in the Garden of Eden when the devil said, did God say? So the attack on the Bible, while it's severe today, is not new. It's been going on for eons. So um, this was just another attack on the Old Testament to create fake versions of the Old Testament. It didn't work because uh, God preserved what he wanted preserved. It, when you, it's, it's interesting, I've read some of these. When you read these, you just don't get anything. There's no life. It's like reading a novel. I mean, you can tell it's not canonical. And, and the people back then could too as well. So uh, they weren't lost, as some have said. They were rejected. Um, with the rise of Christianity, first century AD, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Old Testament finally was consolidated uh, in the first century by the Council of Jamnia. This was a, a meeting of the Jews after the destruction of Jerusalem. They said, what are we going to do? We've got to get our act together. We're going to be destroyed as a nation and as a people. And so they finally formalized the Old Testament as we have it today. So it was really the, uh, by about 100 AD that that was done. Uh, really all they did was just acknowledge what had already been done, what it, what the writings that had already been produced. <clears throat> um, so again, uh, that makes the Old Testament 3,500 years old. God can preserve his word, and he has done so. Tremendous uh, testimony to me. Okay, stark contrast between the Old Testament and New Testament, and the reason is... While the Old Testament took 1,600 years, 1,500 years to write out, the New Testament was produced immediately after Jesus died and was resurrected and went to heaven. Um, I'm going to get into some of the history of some of the, um, of the ages of some of the um, archaeological finds we have, but they date almost to the time of Jesus, 125 A.D. That's not too long after Jesus was resurrected. Um, and so... It took, most scholars think that, today, think that all of the New Testament was written before 70 A.D. I know there's discussion on that. Don't write in and say, Paul, you don't, I know there's discussion on it. I know there are people that say 90 A.D., and I get all that. I'm saying that many scholars now believe that all of the books were written before the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, um, so... Uh, uh, the, the New Testament then did not go through this long, drawn-out process of being compiled. The letters were being written by Paul in his lifetime. And Peter and James and Mark and the rest that produced what we have today, that all happened very rapidly within 30, 40 years of Jesus being here. So it's, the New Testament has a totally different history than the Old Testament. Y'all get that? Different, okay. Um, th by the way, this is an amazing thing because many people in history, especially religious leaders, books were not written about them until sometimes hundreds of years later. Mohammed, books about him written uh, over, well over 100 years after he lived. Buddha, two to 300 years after he lived. This is 30 years after the life of Jesus, I, written by eyewitness, eyewitnesses of his life. 
It's unparalleled in history, especially with religious figures, at least that I found. Um, okay, by the first century, we had letters from Paul, Peter, James, others had been circulated along with the Gospels. Um, I'm not going to get into that. So the Church of the Middle East, Italy, and Egypt began to recognize the books that were going to, would ultimately become canonical. Uh, the congregations that spread out uh, in those areas began to recognize the, the various letters from, from apostles as authentic. Now, let me point out something. Back to my point <clears throat> about apocryphal and pseudepigraphal books, uh, people like Bart Ehrman and Dan Brown of the Da Vinci Code have drummed up this idea that, well, we found a lost Christianity, and these books were written, and they've been, they've been lost, but now we found them. I've got a book down here called The Lost Books of the Bible. They weren't lost, rejected. The early church knew about those. They weren't lost. The church said, those are not going to be canonical. I've read them. They don't read right. Um, they have stories like Jesus making birds out of clay and blowing on them to fly off when he's a kid. He, 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 he uh, communicates with a kid telepathically when he's a baby in a crib, stuff like that. Um, it, it's make-believe stuff. A lot of it is Gnostic. And so these books, and, and I've got a ton of them down here, uh, and I've read most of them, uh, it's very obvious why they're not included in the Bible. And so they weren't lost at all. They were rejected by the early church. Known and rejected. This is an important point. Atheists love to hang their hat on this stuff, and if you can't hang your hat on it. Um, the, the, the early Christians were not stupid. They didn't say, oh, wow, wow there's a whole other Christianity over here. I guess we better go look at that. They knew about the Gnostics. They wrote against the Gnostics. Paul wrote against the Gnostics. The early church fathers knew all these books. They wrote about them. So that's an important point. I, I hope I'm driving that home. Okay, um, <clears throat> bottom line, books of the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, were picked by the Holy Spirit. And um, what the church councils did in the 4th and 5th centuries uh, simply institutionalized what was, and formalized what was already, already decided. Some council didn't do that. That's another lie. Count, church councils did not pick the Bible. The Bible was already picked by the individual congregations spread out in the Middle East, Italy, and Egypt. They decided and the Holy Spirit. So all, that, all, these, all these meetings and councils were, were to um, formalize what was already in place. That's an important point. The church didn't create the Bible, and the Nicene Council did not create the Bible, and Constantine did not create the Bible. Bible created by the Holy Spirit under the direction of all these autonomous congregations. They decided. Important point. Okay, what was the timing and order of the recognition of the books in our New Testament? Well, in general, in general, the order that you have them in your Bible is the order that they were recognized by the local churches, in general. Uh, let me give you a little timeline. Clement, 19, uh, 96 AD, recognized Matthew, Romans, 1 Corinthians, Hebrews, Ignatius, 116, Polycarp, 153, Papias, 155, recognized Matthew, John, Paul's epistles, 1 Peter, 1 John, Acts. I'm hurrying because I've got to move, move along here. Justin Martyr, 165, uh, recognized Mark, Hebrews, Revelation. Clement of Alexandria, 215 AD, recognized all the books of the New Testament. By 200, we're already starting to acknowledge all the books that you have in your Bible in the New Testament. Very quick after the time of Christ. Irenaeus, 203 AD, recognized four Gospels, Acts, 1 Peter, 1 John, all of Paul's letters, Old Latin version, Circa 170 A.D., all of the New Testament except James and 2 Peter. Athanasius, uh, 373 A.D., all books of the New Testament. Jerome, 350 A.D., all books of the New Testament. Third Council of Carthage, 397, resolved that the canonical books would include all 27 books in your Bible. But they didn't decide that. It was already decided by the church fathers and the local congregations. They just formalized it. That's the important point was not a group of people that established the Bible. Not the Catholic Church, not any of the church, early church councils. They were just ratifying what was already done. Hope you all, if you don't get anything else, get that, because that's a huge point. Okay, what was the criteria used by the early church to select the books? Um, <clears throat> one one um, uh, standard was apostolicity. 
was the book written by an eyewitness or a scribe to an eyewitness of the events. That was an important deal. Um, you know, was it written by an apostle? That would be great. Uh, another was a non-contradiction with other Christian writings. Obviously, if you read something in this book that didn't jive with another letter from Paul, there was, there was a problem. Um, the, real, the real deciding factor, of course, is the Holy Spirit. These are all superficial things. These are things that the uh, secularists like to dwell on. Uh, what are the factors that drove the canonization of the Jewish Tanakh in the New Testament in the first place? Well, of course, first was the influence of the Holy Spirit. Secondly, it was a growing need for standardization. After the destruction of Jerusalem, uh, Christianity and Judaism began a serious split. Uh, they, were, they, were, they were somewhat connected very early on, but, the, but a real serious split began in the first century and second century A.D., the Jews saw the Christians advancing, and they said, we have got to standardize the Bible. Uh, we need to collect our writings, and we've got to be consistent. And um, so we, we need to decide what is our canon. Well, it was it had already been decided, but they said we need to formalize that like it looks like the Christians are doing, uh, basically to compete. Uh, there's a rivalry between the Jews and the Christians have their own distinct books. Uh, and finally... Uh, under the influence of Roman Emperor Constantine, fourth century, uh, to reach consensus, um, they, the, at least on the Christian side, they began to um, collect the Old Testament and New Testament as a common book. Uh, uh, Constantine did not establish the Bible. I, I've read that, and it, it's so untrue. <laughs> <laughs> that was not his intent, and that's not what he did. That uh, he just said, "Look, guys, let's all get together. What are we gonna? What are we gonna? What are we gonna believe? And what are, what's going to be our writings?" And they said, "This is what everybody's accepted." He said, "Fine." He didn't decide that. So uh, that's an important point because a lot of people like to hang their hat on that deal. It's all a man-made deal, and it's not true. Um, Constantine lifted the embargo on Christianity, made Christianity the the religion of the Roman Empire. And that followed, he followed uh, Emperor Diocletian, which was the most severe persecution of Christians that they had seen since the death of Christ. Uh, Diocletian believed that the reason the Roman Empire was falling was because of the influence of Christians and the lack of pagan worship. So the best way to do that is kill all the Christians, burn all their writings, and, and reinstitute pagan worship. So um, it was a breath of fresh air when Constantine came in. I know there's a lot of discussion about that. Was he a Christian? He ruined the church. I, I, I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just saying that he didn't invent the Bible. So, um, Along with the, the canonization of the New Testament, uh, the Christians said that we need to have ways to quickly identify our faith. And so the idea of creeds came up. I have a book down here, uh, the first volume of three, on the history of creeds in the church. I don't know if you ever thought about that. I, I, I think about stuff like that. So, Anyway, uh, very interesting. The, uh, you, you probably have recited the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed somewhere if you had a denominational setting. Maybe you've recited those. Those are very early. Very quick. In, in, in a few sentences, you could describe the basics of your belief, and this is what they were trying to do when creeds came up. Now, over time, if you get in the Middle Ages, creeds became seven or eight pages long. Kind of defeated the purpose of, of those originally. But at that point, Christianity was well-established, the theology was, was well-established, and creeds were not quite as important as they were in the early going. Uh, this was a way Christians could identify themselves in the marketplace as they traveled, and uh, what do you believe? And they could, if they could spout that and say that's what they, that was their common belief, well, then they were in. They could be friends. Well, um, with the consolidation uh, of Christi Christianity and Roman Empire, canonization of the Bible, uh, the church uh, became officially uh, sanctioned, and there began the spread of Christianity. I have a, a map at home, and it has uh, the approximate times when various areas were Christianized. This was when the, the leader would be Christian or there was a major uh, Christian uh, culture established in a certain area. And it's really interesting. I looked at the dates and these little dots, and if you put concentric circles around Jerusalem, 100-year and 500-year circles, you can just see the radiation. It, it, it's almost just cir concentric circles that go out from Jerusalem up until the Middle Ages. It's really cool. I, I, I was going to connect the dots in this book, and I, I never did do it, but you can see 
how that works. You can see that as it radiated out. So um, Christianity conti continued to advance uh, for a thousand year period from 400 AD to 1500. Uh, of course, all across the Roman Empire and later into India and even China. They have, um, in eastern China, they have uncovered uh, villages of Nestorian Christians in China. So, interesting deal. Of course, uh, supposedly Thomas went to the um, southern part of India. India, southern India, uh, tends to be fairly Christian. And many believe Thomas went there originally uh, to establish a church there. Um, Bible continued to be um, translated into other languages as this radiation effect uh, took place. And as uh, I read one source, said by 500 AD, Bible had been translated into 13 or more languages at that time. Uh, many of these are known today, such as the Syriac Peshitta. I have a copy down here of the Aramaic Syriac Peshitta New Testament, uh, transcribed by George Lamsa from the original Aramaic into English. I've read most of it reads like your Bible. I know there are a few variances, but essentially it reads like your Bible. We have the Egyptian Coptic Bible, the Roman Latin, uh, and, and others. Um, in some cases, if a culture had no written language, it would be created for them by missionaries. This famous story of two guys that uh, went as missionaries to a Slavic nation, and this particular people group had no written language. They spoke, but no writing. So these two mission, the Christian missionaries said, well, we will invent an alphabet and create a written language for you so that you can have a Bible that you can hand to your kids and grandkids. And so they created a language, and then you know it's used in that country today. That, that language created by Christian missionaries was adopted by that culture, that people group, which continues to this day from medieval times. Amazing story. Um, during this transmission period, and this is going to play into something I'm going to talk about in a little while, that becomes very, very important. Uh, strains of the New Testament uh, began to be formed. And there's a, there's a chart, a handwritten poor boy thing I did one time to help understand all this in the back of this book that you'll get at the end uh, that shows those strains forming. Uh, there was the Alexandrian um, strain, the Antiochian and later Byzantine strain. And the Antiochian and Byzantine strains would form the latter of the received text or the Textus Receptus. And, uh, and to some extent, the majority, I know the majority text is a separate issue, but uh, to some extent, th those, were, uh, those writings were included in that. And what is that? That is the backbone of the manuscripts that we have. Remember the numbers I mentioned to you earlier, all the uncials and minuscules and all that? Okay, if you look at all those fragments, and I'll, I'll give you some timelines here in just a minute, of those fragments, um, uh, you, you see that they're consistent and they, they come through a certain strain. It, I don't have time to get into the technicalities of how they know that, but uh, just trust me on, on, on how that happened. Okay. What is the physical evidence of ancient biblical writings? Uh, what are they? Where are they? Um, thousands of complete Bibles, Old and New Testaments, fragments. Start with the Old Testament. The oldest evidence is a 7th century B.C. amulet. This is a large bracelet. had writing on it with the Aaronic blessing. It reads just like the Aaronic blessing in your Bible. 700 B.C. That makes that 2,700 years old. It reads just like your Bible. So where is the scribal tampering with that verse? Not there. Earliest full Old Testaments uh, from the 8th century A.D. We're talking now the full, complete Old Testament. There are tons of fragments, but I'm talking about a, a complete, uh, put-together Bible. Earliest partially complete Old Testament, Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, this rolled the dates of the Bible back about 1,000 years uh, from our earliest complete Old Testaments that we had up to that time, they date, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls date to around uh, 100 to 200 B.C. And you go, what's the big deal? Here's the big deal. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read numbers that are the numbers of leaves, complete pages from a certain book. Psalms 39, Deuteronomy 33, Genesis 24, Isaiah 22, Exodus 18, Leviticus 17. That's a lot of pages from those books, folks. Uh, 
I've read some of that. It reads like your Bible. Written 100 B.C. Where is the scribal tampering? Yes, there are some typos. These were written by humans. A typo is not a reason for the rejection of any work. If that's true, get all the books out of your house. I've, I've never read a book that didn't have typo. Have you? Okay. We're going to eliminate every book that we read because there's an a E left off of, of the. If you're going to eliminate the Bible, get all the rest of the books out as well. Can't, it's not fair to, to place one layer of, of, of um, rigorousness on a Bible when you don't do it with other books. So the bottom line is these read like your Bible uh, in, in a very essential form. Okay, uh, moving along, transmission of the Bible, 4th century to the 16th century, Christianity continued to advance uh, over that thousand year period. Church became uh, preeminent and, uh, of course, took over the Roman Empire, expanded into India and uh, China. Um, let's see. And so forth. So, um, now, as we get into the 14, 15, 1600s, we could study the, tr the transmission of the Bible in Chinese and Indian and Aramaic, and I'm going to focus on English because that's kind of what is of most interest to us, right? I hope so. That's, I didn't prepare for Chinese. Okay. Okay. Um, got my whistle here. Um, the, the early church, Catholic church, uh, decided to translate the Bible into Latin. Now, I've heard lots of different stories. Um, <clears throat> pro and con. Uh, they did that so that people couldn't read it. They wrote it in a dead language Latin that couldn't be read by anybody. Well, I get that. I don't know. I, the other thing, the other um, uh, opposing deal says that the church wanted to make sure the Bible could not be corrupted, therefore put it in a frozen language and it could not be corrupted because it was not a spoken language, not a language used uh, later on into medieval times. Well, I get that too. I don't know. In any event, that's what it was. Well, <clears throat> uh, so the Catholic Church has the Bible in Latin, and uh, you go to France. Uh, they don't speak Latin. So uh, you're a Frenchman, and you don't have a Bible, but there's one strapped to the pulpit. And so you ask the, the, um, the priest if you can come read the Bible. And he says, sure, I'll be here with you so you don't steal it. Because we only have one. Because it takes over a year to make one of these. And it takes a flock of sheep. So I'm going to watch you. And you get there and it's in Latin. So, bottom line, there were very few Bibles. And the Bibles that were within the Roman Empire, anyway, uh, were written in Latin. So for the most part, they could not be read by the common, common person. You'd have to get a, um, a reservation with a priest to come read the Bible. Um, in the 14-1500s, frustration with the corruption in the Catholic Church began to uh, foment and uh, come to a head. And at the same time, in that same time frame, the Gutenberg printing press was invented. And so for the first time, people could get the Bible in their own hands and compare what it said versus what they were being told. And there was a difference. And people said, whoops, wait a minute. Mr. Church, you're not telling me this, that I'm reading. This is God's Word. Problem. So Protestant Reformation came out of that. Uh, the Protestant Reformation was started by a number of people. Martin Luther gets the credit, but there were Zwingli and uh, Huss and Erasmus, and there were a number of other people that were involved. This was a growing movement. It was not, Martin Luther didn't single-handedly start the Protestant Reformation. He's a lightning rod for that. Historians have to pin stuff on individuals so we can grab a hold of it, but he didn't start that. It, it was a movement that uh, predated him. Um, Martin Luther produced a translation as part of his repudiation of Catholicism in German in 1522, the entire Bible in 1534. I have a leaf from a German Bible down here. It was not Martin Luther's. It was printed after in the 1500s after him. It is a grand, grandchild of his Bible. Um, it's in German, so it's not readable. But anyway, it's down here. Um, Okay, so we're going to focus on English um, and, and kind of hone in on, on that a little bit. Uh, early translations of portions of Scripture 
uh, included some work by uh, Cademan, uh, 600 AD in England, Bede, 735, King Alfred, 18, uh, in the 800s. But really no complete Bible would, would exist uh, in the English language until the 14th century. Uh, with the Protestant Reformation brewing, uh, the first complete English Bible, handwritten, uh, was done by John Wycliffe in uh, 1382. In 1384, he revised that to get rid of some of the typos in 1400. He was an Oxford professor and a theologian, and uh, his Bible was based uh, on the, uh, the Latin Vulgate. Well, with the invention of the Guten, uh, Gutenberg printing press, uh, Bible production improved in quality and quantity. And uh, so now I'm going to give you kind of a quick timeline for the English Bible. When William Tyndale, first to print an English New Testament in 1525. And for his efforts, all of his Bibles that were uh, uh, sent to England were burned. And he was hunted like an animal on the continent. I'm going to skip over the persecution that went on in the production of Bibles in this time frame as the Protestant Reformation was continuing because it gets pretty gory. But people who printed Bibles in languages other than Latin um, did receive the wrath of the church. And uh, there were a lot of martyrs, a lot of people burned at the stake, tortured, strangled uh, for their efforts to, to uh, uh, create Bibles. Miles Coverdale in 1535 produced the first complete printed English Bible. This was cleverly titled the Coverdale Bible. Uh-oh, I hear a voice telling me it's time for a break. <laughs> Tell you what, because of the time, um, let, let's, take, uh, let's just do a five-minute deal and then come back. D don't leave because we're going to get into inerrancy and modern translations that's the bulk of this talk. So don't miss that because that's what affects what you're reading today. So I want to talk about that.